Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show for your weekend edition. The wrap up to, uh, I believe it is the largest, it's one of the biggest gains we've had uh, closing weeks for the S&P 500 in weeks, which is why I have this lovely graphic with me screaming with a horrible face as I'm riding this rocket up. Lucky, at least I saved a little bit of grace by uh, not uh, keeping my position any longer. Gave back roughly 80% of the gains on that options trade, which really sucks. It was such a huge winner, but still ended up taking something home that I gotta be happy with along the way. So cheers, everybody. Happy Friday. It is a, um, what am I in today? Uh, Bib and Tucker. Thank you to my friend Carrie for the, uh, the Bib and Tucker bottle. Delicious stuff, and I hope you all had a great trading week. Let me sip this and we'll get going. Oh, oh, that's a good one. Okay, so let's uh, let's dive right into all things markets. I'll start with our top seven, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, Gallo says, "Darn it, Merlin, it is what it is." You know, it's one thing to to hold on to a conviction and end up being a big loser on it. You know, giving back some of my profits, I never have a problem with that. I didn't want to give back as much as I did on that S and P uh, position. Unfortunately, uh, I gave back more than I wanted to, but I was just, I wanted to give that market a little bit more time to respect that kind of downtrend that it's in. And unfortunately, it went through my level. So you just got to snap your fingers, close that trade, and uh, be happy that there was some money in the account as opposed to, you know, a big losing position. So I'm all right with it. We'll see. Maybe I'll uh, end up jumping back in here short at some point. But right now, uh, I have no short positions whatsoever. No S&P shorts, no Russell puts. I'm out of my QID. So anyway. Brandon, Brandon, you're always bullish. You're always bullish. You're you're uh, you're perpet you're a perpetual bull. You're almost gonna like turn into unscammable over here. <laughs> All right, you, that's an inside joke for those who watch the show for a long enough time. Um, scammable was one of the regulars I used to watch and uh, would would always just give me a hard time when I was any sort of bearish, but. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how it all pans out right now. It's looking strong like bull Totanka. Let me start at the bottom, work my way up. I'm going to start things off with gold. As you can see, the gold chart here, a little bit of an about face today. Kind of a, I don't know if I necessarily call this an engulfing pattern. But all in all, um, to me, gold, I'm still bullish on. It still looks good to me at this moment in time, even though we were down about 1.14% on gold. You know, for me, you have to, I guess you have to ask yourself, where is it the point where you say I'm no longer bullish on gold? And you could use a variety of different tools. I know some of you like moving averages. So, you know, maybe you say if it gets below the 50 period moving average, which conveniently would be below this next area of demand that's kind of uh, below the yesterday, uh, two days ago low. So Wednesday's low. So that's, uh, that's one way to look at your, you know, potential buy points or a point where you say I'm going to be getting out of long position and no longer bullish. And there, okay. I guess going to scale move to a private island to hide. No, man, he's, he was probably doing great, right? I mean, he was bullish. He's been bullish ever since he started watching trader or Power Trading Radio, which was what, four years ago now, five years ago? So he probably did great over the last five years. But, you know, the, to me, trading isn't all about being bullish and riding just bull markets. Markets will change at some point. All right, Dow. Here's our Dow, up 0.96%. Um, just a continued great follow through. I mean, this has been one of the best four day runs you've seen in a long time on these equity indexes. And, you know, the Dow, which usually isn't one of your major movers, I'll give you the percentage here, roughly for the week, 6.5%. I mean, that, that's annual type of returns right there. Remember, the S&P 500 moves on average per year about 8% to the upside. And, well, let's, uh, we'll get to the S&P and show you its gains, but Dow 6.5% up on the week that is great uh, from those lows. Not on the week, but from those lows. Uh, crude oil, continuing with a little bit of a pop here today. Uh, we're up 0.79% on crude oil to 103.79 is where we close at right now. All in all, still bullish. I'm still bullish on it. You know, I, do we end up challenging those 130s? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I think you're going to need more conflict in the in Ukraine and Russia to really fuel that fear factor with regards to crude oil. But that's where we ended up with on the week down overall, but not that bad considering some of the moves we saw. Okay, Russell 2000. Now here's an interesting one. If you notice where we closed at, we were closed at 2085. Now I've got a line in blue on that chart that's right at 2100. And for me, that is really the line in the sand of the sideways consolidation we've had since January in the Russell. Anything above that, and you know, I think you got to turn your bear caps and throw them away real quick, and uh, just ride whatever bullish moves come, regardless of what the Fed's doing, what the market's telling you. You know, if it breaks through there, um, you could see some pretty good upside moves, at least straight to twenty-one sixty, which is where I see the next supply zone. 
Well, Sue, where the heck did 391 a gallon? I'm moving to your state. That's got to be one of the the, the 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 lowest gas prices I've heard of. I almost I paid almost six bucks over here in Orange County. Uh, here's the S&P 500 on the week, which was my nemesis. This was my, from a value perspective, the biggest position I had um, in the options side of things. And good news is, you know, got out yesterday, which is fine. Um, saved myself a little bit to because today was up about 1.4 percent. But let's just calculate the move from the lows of this week to where we ended up. That was a gain of roughly 8.14 percent. And that's kind of why I wanted to bring that one up. Is, you know, you look at the annualized return for a market, which is 8%, and that's going back into 1950. That's the average return. And here we have an 8.14% week in four sessions, four trading sessions. That is pretty unbelievable. Um, obviously, a lot of pent up uh, buying, I guess, or maybe even people trying to squeeze shorts here. It worked because I had to close out mine. You know, it is what it is. And we'll have to wait and see if I decide to go short. But actually, today's level, I really thought about short going short right now as we came into that 45 or 4460 mark because that's really this most recent drop that we saw back on the 16th of February that's the origin of that move so I thought about it and just went no no probably not probably gonna stay away from that one for a little bit and uh, wait and see what pans out if we get maybe up to the 46 then I'll start shortening it again but a, a great move in the S&P Here's your NASDAQ, which was really the gangbuster one today, 2.31% on the session. And since we're doing that calculation, going from the lows four days ago to where we are today, wow. You talk about crazy moves, guys. 11.3% gain in the NASDAQ 100 in four days. Four days, that is a pretty phenomenal rate of return there for the markets, and I'm sure those that are still holding on long positions, uh, loving it. Anybody who's still holding the shorts, you getting smoked. Um, unfortunately, and, and right now you've got a situation where the NASDAQ broke above this kind of consolidation from early March, but the next stop is kind of that same place I see with the S&P, which is those highs that we saw on February 16th, and that's at 15, or sorry, 14,580 will be the next level. So you are got about 140 points till we get there, but that could happen very, very quickly. All right, and finally, something to cheer about. Bitcoin, yay! Bitcoin up 2.59% on the session. Although, remember, we had the same chart a while back with gold, where gold really wasn't making higher highs, wasn't making higher lows, was just kind of traversing sideways and compressing. It looks like what's happening with uh, Bitcoin right now. So even though we're up 2.5%, and it's great because uh, I, you know, obviously I have a, a much longer term view on cryptos and I've got a sizable portfolio, um, I certainly like the gains, but Again, nothing really that exciting for me until we get above 4,500 or 45,000 on Bitcoin. Once that happens, that's that's when I'm going to start be cheering and very excited for those upside gains. Hopefully, we'll see if they keep on moving to the upside. All right, so that is a quick wrap up of our top seven. I don't know why I feel like I'm out of breath. I think it has to do with being excited for the week and just needing another sip of whiskey. There we go. Okay, much better. Uh, I'm going to keep going through some of these other factors, at least things that I was watching today. Obviously, we want to keep our eye on that dollar index because right now I don't see like much happening with that dollar index. But remember, we had on that Wednesday meeting, Jerome Powell saying very clearly, we are going to unwind our balance sheet. Not we might, not we could, not theoretically. We are going to unwind our balance sheet. And if we look at the numbers of the balance sheet, it's, it's astounding. If we go back 14 years and go back to 2008, the balance sheet of the Fed was 800 billion. And that of course sounds like a ton of money, but it was 800 billion. Fast forward 14 years and now we're over $8 trillion on their balance sheet. That's a factor, that's a 10X rate of return. Well, not rate of return, but that's a 10X factor increase in the Fed's balance sheet. Now, that's important to me because so many things we talked about with Bill Addis, you know, it's, it, Bill mentioned the things that keep him up at night and he keeps him awake. For me, it's conversations with Bill Addis that keep me awake. So if you look at what was going on here with the 10 year, remember they, they bought all of these treasuries with different maturities, but a lot of the 10 year trying to kind of keep things under control there. But if they start unloading their 10 year portfolio, that means there's a ton more supply. That means that the the price of the bonds are going to drop significantly 
and then the interest rate that's earned on those bonds will have to rise. They're going to have to pay more money to attract people to that portfolio of bonds. And uh, you know we've already seen that, I think, priced in. We saw a huge move from 1.7% all the way up to over 22 in just a week. That is pretty phenomenal. Now, you know, for me, I, I think that we'll probably see a pullback in this 10-year, but that trend, I believe, is going to keep on moving to the upside because as soon as they start unwinding, that means more flooding the market with bonds and those yields are going to rise. Now, uh, if you're looking at the date of when this might happen, May 4th is the next meeting. That'll be a, an interesting one. Now, there was one other fact that we looked at, which I think is really important for everybody here. You remember, I think it was Tuesday, maybe even Monday, I was talking to you about how the Fed Funds futures had priced in a 34% chance, right? A 34% chance of rates rising from 25 basis points all the way up to two, right? You guys remember that? I hope you do. Those numbers shifted greatly in the last two days. And here's what the forecast is. It's even more now. So it was supposed to be seven rate increases. Let's check out December here. Oh, wow, it, it shifted back today. That is crazy. I was watching this today and they were pricing in a 34, or sorry, 43% chance. Wow, this shifted so quickly today. Hmm, it's amazing how different um, <laughs> one day can be. Because they, you can see yesterday, see here it says 44.6. I'm highlighting in blue. That means there was a 44.6% chance they're going to raise eight times by December. And now it's dropped back down to 28%. So, of course, this big rally we had today, uh, leaving a little bit of pressure and thought that we might get more rate increases. But uh, we still have a 37% chance we're going to be at 2% by December, a 28% chance that we'll be at two and a quarter, which would represent eight increases. So pretty crazy to see... Um, big pops like that yes may the fourth right frank may the fourth be with you don't surrender to the dark side which could happen if we get uh, uh the wrong talk track from powell on that may 4th meeting that'll be an interesting one so just thought i would bring this one up because i think the more we look at these these facts and figures you know the more it does point towards things slowing down but as i mentioned yesterday it can keep going up for a while you know it doesn't have to immediately put the brakes on the market so there's your 10 year you had a little bit of a slide today but all in all it's still a great looking uptrend at this moment in time uh you did have some quiet uh wild swings in commodities so for example here you had wheat was down about 3.12 percent but still holding significantly higher levels than it has been at. So just because the tension may seem to be subsiding slightly, wheat has not. Uh, natural gas, which you talked about, that is still trending the upside. You know, we hit some supply at right around five yesterday, and here we are with a little bit of a pullback from that five mark. You had corn as well, just slightly down, but you know, someone asked me yesterday, is this forming a bull flag? And the answer is yes. For those that don't know what a bull flag is, it's a very simple pattern. It just really kind of speaks to the um, buyers and sellers and kind of what they're doing in that situation. So you have an impulse move, which is this right here. And then you have kind of a consolidation of price on corn. And the theory is that if it breaks out, it's going to move that distance, which, you know, unfortunately could put um, corn at 70, sorry, 875. That would be significantly higher than where we're at. But you know, that's if you're using measuring objects, etc. Bottom line is, it's not really selling off, even though it's had uh, a giant run up. Corn is just kind of, well, we're just kind of traveling sideways, slightly lower lows, but nothing really that that bad. Uh, and normally, again, when you get these big pumps like you did here on wheat, you get a huge pump and you get a pretty large pullback. It didn't really get that with corn. Uh, we don't need to look at lumber or soybeans, so I guess that will do it for commodities. And lastly, let's check out some currencies. Of course, you guys, I think I mentioned at the end of yesterday's show, we had the British pound deciding to raise rates. They raised by 25 basis points. Well, you're still seeing that downtrend. So I'm going to see if I can get David Warner on and see if he's still all in on that uh, British pound. To me, it seems like that trend needs to be changing to sell the rips, right? Sell those pullbacks into supply because that trend, at least since May of last year or May of 2021, uh, is looking a little bit weaker and weaker and weaker. So what else? I had the dollar on there. I talked about the British pound. We don't really have much to say on the Aussie or the Japanese yen other than the U.S. dollar is extremely strong and that gen is, yen is very, very weak. Uh, big up to not a big can of for, fan of corn, but my food does, I think. <laughs> I like that. It's funny. I would, there's like some bunch of stupid vegetarian jokes, but my friends are always like, oh, why, why don't you just go vegetarian? I go, I am vegetarian. 
you know, I let all, all the things that I eat eat the vegetables for me. So I just kind of let them do the work. All right. Let's see. Uh, let me go back here real quick. I see Matt sent a question, but I want to get to Joe's. Uh, question from yesterday. Are the interest rate hikes able to have an effect on the staking rewards of crypto in that stretch? No. So inflation, whatever those rate changes may be, interest rate hikes has zero impact on the rewards for the cryptocurrency. So when you look at something like Polkadot, right? Polkadot gets you around 13.8% staking rewards. If you do it at Kraken, you're going to get 12. That has zero impact with inflation, the Fed, none, none of that matters. All that matters is the code. It's already pre-programmed in. So there's a, a schedule of what the staking rewards will be at certain points in time. And for most cryptocurrency projects, that staking reward is going to drop or diminish over time uh, once the project gets more established. So nope, never... Uh, never going to be a factor for the, the rewards you get for staking. Now, what could be impacted are is if you go out to lending sites, you know, so if you use crypto.com, they may adjust their rewards because remember, you're not staking at crypto.com. You are lending cryptocurrencies to them and they lend it out. So that may be impacted by inflation or um, interest rate increases, etc. cetera. Uh, what was the next stop for the NASDAQ? Perhaps, yeah, I, I don't know what the next stop is. Remember, I, I'm no Oracle, but what I'm looking at here, if we look at where the NASDAQ is, you know, we just kind of popped above this most recent high. So all I have to do is, for me anyway, is I look and see where was the last area that it had a real struggle with, and that's, call it 14.6. Uh, 14,600 would be the next area that I think the NASDAQ's going to have trouble with. There you go. Let's see. Keep moving down here. Bullard uh, wants to see 3%. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, if he gets 3%, that's going to you know spook the market a little bit more. Um, Frank says, can you look at PayPal? All right. I mean, it's Friday. Come on. Of course I will, Frank. PYPL. So, you know, PayPal was one that I, I like the company. I, I love what they do. I use their services. But it was one of those ones where you look at the price chart and you go, this looks like garbage, right? At this point, I think you're a buy on PayPal. I think you're, it's a go long on PayPal type of situation. Let me get rid of some of this old artwork we've done here. This is gonna all go away. And the reason I say now is a go is today, you can see today's trading broke above this high that we had on March 1st. Now that does not mean in any way, shape or form that this is the bottom and this is a reversal and we're gonna see nothing but higher highs. But it is really the first time on this price chart that you can see we've really made a significant high um, a, a new high, right? We made one back here, which was on October 20th of 2021, but it wasn't really that significant. It was like a little slight little breach and then came ripping back down. So it's certainly a positive sign, it, it, but it is no means a, hey, load the boat. This is the beginning of a brand new bull trend for PayPal, but you have it making a higher high, which means whoever was holding that down right around 113.06, it's they're now out of the way we've gone through that overhead supply and now it's going to be a question of where does paypal go next and i like paypal i'm glad you brought this one up you notice the there's two spots that are going to become critical and that's where it gapped down to and where the origin of the gap was so on paypal i'm looking at roughly uh 140 as the next real target and after that you're looking about 176 good one frank i like it um, let's see. Do, do, do. do you think the Fed may hold bonds through to maturity rather than selling them back to the market? I think they'll sell some of them. Yeah, Matt, I don't think they'll unload the whole thing. Can you imagine how crazy the markets would be if the if the Fed just said we're unloading all eight trillion? No way. No way. They're gonna get back down to some normal level. And unfortunately, I, I don't have the charts that we looked at yesterday with Bill. But uh, you know, do they get down below six trillion? Right, that would be a pretty logical target. And again, I think it's important to understand that it's not just one maturity, right? Of course, there's tons of the short-term maturities, but there's 10 years in there as well. There's also, and this is what I don't hear anybody talking about, and I'd like to see uh, a real estate veteran talk to me about this. But if you look at mortgage-backed securities, $2 trillion of the Fed's portfolio at this exact second is mortgage-backed securities. And for those that know what mortgage-backed security is, you take all the crap mortgages, the ones that are in trouble, you bundle all those, in, not all of them, but you, you take up mortgages, you bundle them into a package and you sell those off to investors. And the one who's been buying all those and propping up that market and making sure that there's um, you know, a good return is the Fed. The Fed's bought $2 trillion worth. So if the Fed starts to unload mortgage-backed securities, and let's be honest, it's the most robust housing market we've seen since 2006, 7, 8, and 6, 7, 8, 
there's no need for the Fed to be buying mortgage-backed securities. None whatsoever, in my opinion. If you think that there is a reason why the Fed should be buying mortgage-backed securities, I would love to hear why. Not in a confrontational way, but maybe I'm missing something. But I look at the housing market and I think there's no way and no reason for the Fed to be buying mortgage-backed securities. It's just, there's no point to it. It's a robust market. Let it be. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a market that has actually been inflated because of the Fed's actions of buying mortgage-backed securities. Now, all of a sudden, they're going to unload those things. So if they start to unload those mortgage-backed securities, that could all of a sudden have a pretty significant impact on the housing market as well. And I don't Personally, I don't know enough about the construction of mortgage-backed securities portfolios to know what the direct impact will be, but my mind tells me it, it, it's got to be significant. You, know, you, you can't just liquidate those things and all of a sudden the market goes, okay, it's all good. We'll just absorb that and keep on going higher. Seems to me like that's going to be a problem. So Matt, no, I don't think the Fed's going to sell them all. I think they'll hold some to maturity, but I think they need to lighten their load a little bit. Uh, let's see. The Federal Reserve is going to expand their balance sheet even more. Uh, yeah, well, the tape, the taper is they've stopped buying, right? So they've, they've stopped their purchases. So that's already a, a start to the, uh, the, re, the removal of cash from supply. What they've done, first off, is they had to taper, get down their purchases, because that's a stimulus. They want to get that out of the way for inflation purposes. Now that you've got that out of the way, you can start to raise rates. And then once you start to raise rates and see that impact, you can now start selling that portfolio and remove money from supply. Because remember, there's multiple ways to increase or to uh, reduce inflation. Number one is you raise interest rates, right? You make everything more expensive. You, you kind of choke people out of the market, if you will. Number two is you remove money from circulation, which is what they're going to do by selling their positions and retiring that cash. So we'll see. I, I do think that they're going to start selling in, in May, um, especially if this conflict with Ukraine and Russia is not resolved and we have higher inflation, then they'll kind of be forced to. They're in a tough spot. Uh, the Fed will unload at a rate of $1 trillion every 20 years to create that soft landing effect. I think it'll be a little faster than that, um, but it is... It's a precarious situation. I certainly would not want to be in Jerome Powell's position because everyone in the world thinks that Jerome Powell caused this. It wasn't just Jerome Powell. What's that mean? Collateralized debt? Is that from my talk track or someone else? Collateralized debt, um, it, it depends on which entity is doing it, but normally there is like a collateralized loan be collateralized debt right uh, and they do this a lot in the crypto space whereas if you want to borrow a amount let's say you want to borrow a hundred thousand dollars they'll say okay you have to put something up as collateral so you put up some bitcoin and you can now buy borrow money using something as collateral that's collateralized debt for inflation to go down you need you need disinflation or deflation oh well Yes, obviously, you. if you're having rising prices, then you need to deflate prices, right? Well, in this case, they may not have the ability to deflate prices, so what they do is they raise interest rates to make the cost of capital more expensive and slowly choke out the economy to get people to spend less. They're going to try to get you to spend less. Did I miss your question, GD? Well, I didn't miss your question. I'm, I'm busy over here. Uh, Merlin, do you believe the self-fulfilling prophecy of the death crosses? To, uh, no, I don't. Not a fan of those. You know, I look at them and I, I know that people react to them. So I'll bring one up here and we'll add it. So here's your your 15. Your, uh, this is a 50 and a 20. Let me make this a 200. So when the 50 period moving average crosses below the 200, that's considered a death cross. So PayPal died long time ago, <laughs> if that's in fact the case. If Bitcoin just had a death cross. You can see Bitcoin right here was a death cross when the 50 crossed below the 200. And that's when Bitcoin was at... 38,000. Well, we're higher than that now. Uh, you can look at the S&P 500 and you have a death cross. The death cross happened right here when we were roughly 4,200 on the S&P. And ironically, that's kind of where it bounced from. So I don't believe them. I think they're inherently significantly lagging GD. I think, um, you know, golden crosses, death crosses. Well, it's fun to talk about. If you're telling me, let's see, find something here that's got one recently. If you're telling me that you're going to look at the Dow and say, ooh, it's on a death cross, I better start selling right where I put this big vertical line. All right, there's your death cross. All right, because it it's going to be the next day. This, this candle is what creates it. So it's this point right here. 
If you're going to start selling when this thing's at 32,600, I got to ask you, where were you when it was at 36 or 35 or 34 or 33 or 30, you know, now now you're just you're late. And if you follow that rule and you went short right here because that's what the death cross told you, you basically bought right at the dead low as this thing came screaming back up. So I'm not a fan of them. I do look at them because I think it's a sign that the masses are about to do something stupid. But for the most part, I, I leave them alone. Okay. Holy cow. We got all kinds of comments coming through here. Uh, Facebook has made some chart patterns. It's the same chart patterns as people. Yeah. You know, you and again, Facebook's one of those ones that you know, everybody's... I guess falling out of favor with Facebook. Facebook is not going away. Facebook will modify. They'll change. You know, they got Instagram right now. They're going to start doing um, NFTs on Instagram, etc. So they're they're trying to stay hip and stay relevant. But you know, the question that you have to ask yourself if you're thinking about going long Facebook, and I've got a couple of friends who've been asking me a lot about going long on Facebook, is how low do you think it can go? Like, where's your stop loss? So if you're buying right now because it it does have the same similar pattern as uh, PayPal. It's not as consistent, but um, it did break above this most recent high. Then, okay, fine. But where's your stop loss? Because the trend, really, since August of last year, September 1st or late August, has been just down, 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 down. They're getting lots of bad press and, you know, talking about their ad revenue getting hurt. You know, it, it doesn't look good long term. So, where's your, just make sure you have a stop loss in there. So, if you end up buying it, you know, 215 as it broke out, all right, great. What's my stop loss? And it's most likely going to be below these lows, which would be about a $30, $30 stop loss. That's pretty damn big. Pretty damn big. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been an ugly one for Facebook, that's for sure. Um, oh, well. I got out of my 252. I'm, I'm happy with it. <laughs> uh, Merlin, did you catch that NFTs are coming to Spotify? I didn't see that. NFTs are going to be ubiquitous part of most businesses, whatever. Yep, I, I agree. Um, you know, I don't. I'm not a big fan of these NFTs like the the board apes or cypherpunks. I think that, that is just freaking stupid. I think it's one of the dumbest things on the planet. However, um, as a project, as a concept, as a technology, NFTs are here to stay without question. Anything that we can have ownership of in a digital space will be NFTs. And um, you know, music. I've been talking about this in the CIL. Music, in my opinion, is one of the biggest use cases for. NFTs because you're actually buying something that has utility. I can listen to music. A bored ape or a beeple, I don't care. I'll right mouse click and stick it on my wall and copy and paste that thing. So, not a fan of most of the NFT stuff that's going on right now, but I do think it's here to stay. Just it will modify over time as we see utility and use cases for digital assets and ownership. Um, all right, so let me go to some questions here. Oh, shoot, I didn't put the name on this one. Dab Nabbit. Uh, I think this might have been less. Oh, no, this is Tom. Tom, you sent this one in. He says, so how would you explain all the huge amounts of additional cash in the economy now? Where is it and how did it get there? Well, I would say, and, and I'm not a business owner. Well, I am a business owner, but I've never um, applied for any of these loans that went out. These, I don't remember how many, was it trillions of dollars worth of loans that went out to the economy for businesses that were suffering and had to shut down and you know you had to prove that you were closed. Look. I during this whole pandemic, I live in I live in Costa Mesa. But if you look at Newport Beach, right, you got a very Republican area. A lot of the businesses there were literally just going, "Screw you, we're not shutting down." Masks? No, we're not requiring masks. There's a bar right down the street. It's called uh, the Wild Goose. The Wild Goose was open every day throughout the pandemic, shoulder to shoulder people a hotbed for COVID. Like that was the breeding ground for COVID. I've been told that every bartender in that place got COVID. It was just nonstop. My assumption would be that that guy who owned it, and Mario, his name is Mario. He owns a whole bunch of bars here in Orange County as well. My assumption would be that Mario stayed open, collected a whole bunch of money, business as usual. And matter of fact, his business was more packed than normal because it was one of the few places that were open. And he's also going to file to get that PPP money, which is a, uh, a loan that you don't have to pay back. So that's really not a loan. And I know there's thousands of companies across the US that were applying to get these loans. So that money went straight to businesses, right? And poured into um, businesses around the US and helped them survive. So a lot of businesses, their earnings, their fundamentals just don't look great at all, but they got all this money to, to keep alive. And who knows what they did with it? Um, you also have a lot that was done with 
stimulus checks, right? A ton of money coming in through stimulus checks and, and emergency relief for different things. So I think a lot of the money came in that way. And that's part of the reason that's boosting it up. But again, a lot of it is sitting on the Fed's balance sheet. Again, $8 trillion right now on the Fed's balance sheet, a bulk of that happening in the last two years. Now, I believe it went from like 3.9 to over eight in two years. It was actually starting to drop down in 2017 and 18. We actually saw the Fed balance sheet unwinding. They were unloading stuff on their balance sheet. And then COVID hit and they refilled it real quick. Maybe Zuck should step down. I don't think he will. I think he's got a little too much pride there. Actually watching some interviews with him, you know, I actually don't mind Zuckerberg. He definitely has an idea of what the future holds. Um, I think that, you know, he might be a little bit greedy in the process. But um, Tom says, the money given to businesses isn't additional money. It just replaced money lost due to lockdowns. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I don't think it was money lost due to lockdowns. A lot of places were open. A lot of places were still open. They didn't have... So... They, so your servers disappear because you couldn't seat, sit in restaurants. I know in SoCal here, you couldn't sit inside the buildings. But, okay, they just sit, sat people outside or they set up full-on delivery stations. So the restaurants were still open, right? We could still get food, but they're getting all this money. So I, I disagree with that. I actually think that there was a, a, a significant additional pump of money into businesses. And it's not just, you know, restaurants, et cetera. I think a lot of corporations were just filling out an application saying, hey, if we get money, we get money. Um, you're seeing now stories about a lot of people getting getting caught for fraudulently saying, hey, I'm a business. I, I had to shut down. Give me some PPP money, you know. Um, that That's definitely part of the equation that I think, you know, is unfortunate because you have some people who are not exactly honest. But, oh, well. Um, uh, what money? The country is broke. No, we're not. We're, Brendan, we'll never be broke. We've got infinite money. Remember, we've got infinite money. Uh Less. I'm not even exactly sure what this was less. I, I actually, I copied and pasted. I'm trying to, uh, to do things quickly before the show. So let me just real quickly check. Uh, I don't think this was less. I want to give proper attributes out to whoever um, made this comment. So real quickly, let me just pull up our, my YouTube channel and check the comments. This is from yesterday. Uh, this was not less. This was Jeff. There you go. It's Jeff. Jeff says, I bought one spy put expiring July 380 strike. All this market down every day uh, a week ago was driving me crazy. The funny thing is, since I bought it, I'm not so anxious. Is there a hedging strategy where you may also have a short position on? Well, you know, I think, um, and, and this is just for me, I'm generally more of a person who's going to kind of go directionally. So, you know, right now I had to get out of my positions because the market told me, hey, we're not really drifting down like we were. It showed a little bit too much strength and broke through some overhead levels. So I'll get out of all mine. There are a lot of people out there, especially when you're feeling uncertain about a, a, your portfolio or where you're at, that you, you will want to hedge, right? And so let's say you've got, you know, $100,000 worth of S&P equities long. Well, you could go out there and buy some puts on the S&P right? So buying those puts is a small amount of capital. And then you buy the specific amount of puts needed to cover your $100,000 portfolio and therefore you hedge. Uh, I don't do that personally. I tend to be more of a just, if I think it's going this way, that's where I'm going, period. But that's, I think that's different than um, most people. And again, I'm a bit more active than, than I would say the average person. So you bought the, uh, I hope you bought it today. You probably got pretty cheap 380s. Let's go look at the 380s here just so you can get an idea where SPY was. Oh yeah, and Big Eb, you asked about my silver. Yeah, silver. So I had the 385s. Those are gone. Uh, you're at 380. You're even lower. So you probably got some real cheap ones, but you bought out to July. That's pretty good. You, got, you gave yourself plenty of time on that one. I like that. Um, so cool. Yep, I I don't see a problem with that one. You got them, You got those cheap, Jeff. Got them cheap. Uh, what other questions I have? So let's go to this one. This is actually from yesterday, but I didn't get a chance to get to it. Uh, Les asked, would you say that the markets went up today because of a lot of uncertainty was removed with the Fed statements? And I, I think absolutely. You look at uh, the move that this market has had over the last 72 hours. Here is your, your pop. I'll go to the S&P. Let's go to something that's clean. NASDAQ, cleaner. Let's get these stupid moving averages off here because I don't need them. Um, you know, when you have a pop like that, yeah, I do think a lot of it is, okay, the Fed has been saying they're going to raise rates, but there was so much speculation. Are they or are they not? 
And now all of a sudden we do see, okay, not, not only are they raising rates, but they're going to continue and the forecasts seem to be fairly aggressive. So you would think that that announcement of you know seven potential rate increases this year would have had a significantly negative impact on the market, right? But I, I agree with less. I think a lot of it was, okay, okay great. We, do, we know it's liftoff time. We just want to make sure that's out of the way. So now we have a clear idea what's happening. And I think a lot of people are thinking, we've got liftoff with regards to rates. But again, those this rate increase that happened on Wednesday, it's going to take minimum nine months, most likely closer to 18 months till it actually comes through and hits our economic data. It takes a long time for that that rate increase to impact the financial firms and the lending process and earnings and all that. It's not just like, hey, oh, we're going to feel the impact. So I think that that is uh, the big factor here with these announcements is people realize the markets are still most likely going to go up because it's still cheap, easy money. Money is still flooding the market right now. So great, buy, 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 buy. But at some point, it will start to slow down. And at this point, I think people are taking advantage of this market little rally. So Jared says, let's go. Yeah, well. I mean, right now it is a let's go type of equation. Of course, uh, you know, my, my face might look a little bit different. It looks more like that, but that's okay. We'll uh, have a little pouty face on my face for a while. All right. S. Gerard. Good to see you and welcome. Yes, I forgot to say welcome. It seemed like a new name in here. Um, St who, Stephanie? Where's Stephanie? Um, I'm trying to read back through. You guys get all kinds of stuff. Chris, you got 116,000 PPP loan, and it saved me. Never close a day. Awesome. All right. Even, but but see, there's the point. You said you worked even more to stay afloat. So you you were working, and your business dropped a little bit. I don't know if it completely shut down. I'm sure a mechanic isn't is different than a restaurant, right? Because I can drop off my car, and a mechanic can fix it. But you know, your business, you were still open, and you had this extra cash on top. So. You know, it, to me, it. I think that the the amount of cash that PPP helped, and certainly I, I'm glad it helped you out. But I think there were a lot of people out there that absolutely abused that money. And, and again, I'm referencing the wild goose out here in Costa Mesa in, um, in Newport Beach. But they weren't the only ones. This guy owns like seven bars and restaurants, and they were all packed to the gills. If he was going to stay open and his business was fine, he should receive no money for PPP. In my opinion, for that guy, anyway. Uh, Tom's the restaurants lost. Sit down revenue is much higher than takeout. Of course, uh, mostly to drinks, especially the kind. Of, you know what's, <laughs> um, you know what's kind of funny is one of my favorite places around here. They actually were doing alcoholic drinks to go, which they don't do that anymore. But it was weird for a lot of year. You could go, oh, can I get uh, you know this cocktail and this cocktail? And, and and it's interesting because you would I would actually buy those drinks, which is kind of silly because I'm going to eat the food at my house and I've got a full bar. So why would I do that? And part of it was, I want to support my local establishment. So they give you these, uh, they had them in mason jars. So you get like a mason jar of a margarita or a Bloody Mary or whatever you want. That was, that was kind of fun. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Let's see, what else do I got? Everybody knows they were lying about inflation, Brendan. Everybody knows. Uh, the big question one must answer right now is, are the Fed lying or are they honest? Well, I wouldn't trust the Fed anyway. I built my premise that they're, gonna, that they're liars. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what else do I have here? Questions that came through. Ah, good. I got through all my questions for today. That's great. Uh, why were they told now? Well, you'll never know. You'll never know um, if they're telling the truth or not. So I watch, one of the shows I like to watch is NCIS with Mark Harmon. And it's an old show, but it's always fun. He said something once that was funny. I think it's rule number nine. If you're gonna lie, be specific because the more specific you are, the less of a lie it sounds like. And to Brendan's point here, we had uh, we had the Fed saying, we're doing this, 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 and being very specific about it. So when I heard that, I was kind of laughing because I, all I could think was Mark Harmon going, rule number nine, if you're gonna lie, be very specific. And our Fed has been about as specific as you can get. Um, so Mark, yeah, let's talk about my silver. So as you guys know, I've got SLV. I was really hoping it would have closed under 23.50. Well, lo and behold, we're at $23.02 today. So, you know, those options that I sold, I sold some uh, calls against my position, but basically generated about, I think it was 1.5 or almost 2% on that um, on that contract, and that was for 30 days. So, you know, I'll, I'll take 1.5% for 30 days on top of the gains I was getting. So now the question is going to be, come Monday, what do you do, or what do I do, right? Right now we're at 23 bucks. I'll probably wait and see 
what happens uh, Monday or where we open up with regards to silver, but I'll probably sell the at the money and I'm thinking I'm gonna go weeklies because I can probably get 1% per week selling the weekly options at the money. So let's say it opens up at uh, 2350 next week on Monday. I might actually go out there and sell the Friday 2350s and if I can get 1% or more, I'll probably do it because 2350 was my target anyway. So I will just be generating more and, and we'll evaluate. You know, I might try to sell the 24s or 2450s because I do think silver is going to go higher, but I want to be generating some income along the way. Yes, Big Ab, I will definitely be selling 100%. I'm going to be selling more covered calls. The question is, do I do it at the money? Normally I do out of the money by a good chunk. I do out of the money for 30 days typically where I'm going to get at least 1% extra on the portfolio. Right? That's pretty much my MO with regards to that portfolio. That is my 1% portfolio that I've talked about on this program before. So, um, you know, am I disappointed that I didn't get my silver taken away? No, no, not at all. I'm actually, I'm fine with it because I, now it gives me an opportunity to consistently sell more calls against this, generate. And if I do the 24s next week or the 2350s, um, it's really about what premium am I going to get. And for me, in my brain, it's all about percentage rates of return. I want to make sure I get at least 1% for the month on SLV. If I can get one or two, uh, or you know, two or higher, great. And I think next week I'll probably start looking at weekly options on silver just because volatility has been so high and I think a lot of people are going to be looking to, um, to jump into silver, which would make my calls more desirable, thus the premium gets a little bit higher. Um, Northside Trades says, like to know more about imbalance locator where to find it and how to use it. Um, I don't know what you mean by imbalance locator. Is this a, I don't, if it's a technical indicator, I have never used balance locator. What I'm looking at, and if you're talking about when I say things were out of balance, there was a buyers and sellers, et cetera, that's just looking at price charts. That's looking at the price action, the characteristics of how prices leaves levels. Um, there's little footprints that are left by institutions or, or big traders in the marketplace. Uh, I don't really leave a footprint because I'm not trading huge. Right? I don't usually trade very large. Whereas Goldman or JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, those guys, they're trading much bigger accounts. They could be trading hundreds of thousands of shares at a time or contracts. So they'll leave footprints with regard to their actions. And I think that's, what I'm, that's typically what I'm referring to when I talk about imbalances between buyers and sellers. Uh, do you think short-term trade on TQQQ is smart right now? Hmm. Going, you're going with the crazy stuff, huh? Well, when you say short-term, I guess the question is, you know, what type? So, but this is ultra pro. So, is this the triple? Uh, let's see. This is up six point two. So, yes, this is the triple. Um, you know, this is these are dangerous, Shemev. These are real dangerous to be using, especially if you hold long-term. I've mentioned this many, many times. So if you use um, these triple leverage ETFs, it's got to be for short-term, right? If you hold these for weeks to months to years, you're going to lose more money every single day because of decay. Now, the challenge with this T triple Q is technically you're sitting right at supply. And I would look at the NQ for this and say, you know, you're coming right in an overhead supply level. So if you get above the 14,600 and close above that on the NASDAQ 100 futures, then I would say, okay, if you think you're gonna get a nice little pop to the upside, then sure, go for T triple Qs, right? Go for it. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm wary about these because if you're on the wrong side of it, if you're on the wrong side of a triple leverage ETF, your account can disappear very quickly. Um, I, like, I remember years ago, I remember years ago I used to, uh, teach physical classes for Online Trading Academy. I haven't done that in many, many years. But uh, FAS and FAZ were a couple of the ones that just destroyed people's accounts. And I had people like crying in class. I'm like, well, you know, you know, take the guy aside. What's going on? He's like, oh, you know, I, I, I'm in FAS or FAZ and, and I'm, I'm just getting destroyed. It's like, yeah, those are triple of the most volatile market segments right now. Stay away from those things. So, um, <laughs> thanks. That's right, KF. Smash the like button. Uh, I've got pretty much regulars on here anyway, so we smash that like button, everybody. Uh, what are the, what are the things you want to talk about? I didn't get a chance to go and do your economic calendar for Monday. I just been too damn busy. So let me real quick go to uh, Forex Factory. There wasn't a lot happening for Monday. Monday will probably be the last show for me for about a week. Um, Tuesday I got all kinds of stuff I got to take care of, and then I'm going to be taking off to get out of town, and I got to people staying here at the house, so I gotta get them all set up. So here's what's cooking for Monday. 
Um, really nothing important yet for the U.S. You do have Jerome Powell speaking, but he's got a couple of speaking engagements happening next week. This one right here is for, which one is this for? The Business Economics Annual Economic Policy Conference. I don't really care about this one. But there's an announcement that's happening Wednesday you guys should definitely pay attention to, and that is on he's, uh, for the Bank of International Settlements. He's actually going to be at the Bank of International Settlements talking about digital assets uh huh, and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. So I think that's a very important one to pay attention to. And then earnings-wise, there's really nothing happening next week. It's really just snooze fest. Uh, there's a couple companies on Wednesday, but I'll put that in the Monday morning must-knows. You guys can check out. Uh, you can go to uh, Online Trading Academy's YouTube page, and you'll see the Monday morning must-knows there. Uh, it, was, it was a fun one. Um, is the balance like a... Oh, I don't know, Alan. I don't watch Trader TV. Uh, sub 10,000 market cap, all over it. Okay, nano, a little tiny crypto stuff. Well, the button mashing worked in Street Fighter. It also <laughs> left, right, up, down, left, right, up, down, wherever that move was. Triple levers and trailing stops are fine. I'm back in a little bit of FNG. Right, and I guess that's the important part, right, Tom, is the trailing stops, right? If you get a great trend, these triple leverage ETFs are amazing, but you can't like what happens all too often is someone buys something, you know, like let's say it's T triple Q, that's a triple uh, triple long, and you get it all of a sudden you're underwater a little bit. Like, oh, I'll just hold it till it comes back. And it, even if it just stays flat, you're losing money every day because of uh, decay. Is it time to start logging about buying calls for Rivian? Um, that's a good question. You know, we talked about you know the the resurgence of EVs or just the surge of EVs. If you go Lucid, no, it doesn't look like that. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, you are you just made a, uh, a new high today, but it didn't really close above it. So it's still looking weak on Lucid. If you talk Rivian, um, uh, I forget the ticket. Is RIVN? Yeah, Rivian. You know, these all look bad. Even though there's a hook up for four days, remember the market's been up, NASDAQ, for example, is up 11%, uh, and Rivian is up pretty good today as well. But the trend still looks down. So I, I would say if you are looking at going out to um, Rivian or Lucid or any of these EV companies, Neo reports next week that you put a, uh, you know, you you go out and do longer term options. You know, maybe go buy some leaps on these if you can, because right now that trend looks down, and I don't know if this is the bottom. You know, don't think that oh well, Rivian's uh, IPO price was seventy eight bucks and here it is trading at forty five. Mm, that doesn't mean much. That doesn't mean much at all. Uh, this thing could keep going lower and lower and lower, and I don't I don't know where this thing could ultimately end up. I don't know if it go to zero, but I certainly would be careful on it. But if you feel Joe and others that Rivian or Lucid or Neo uh, are are good options for you, then then go for it. You know they all had pretty nice pops this week, that's for sure. Uh, what else? Uh, housing market numbers are kind of shitty today. I had them up here, didn't I? Um, yeah, but you know the market shrugged it off. Market just discounted that right away. Here's your uh, existing home sales. Previous number was 6.49 million existing home sales. They expected it to drop to uh, 6.1. We came out at 6.02. So yeah, it was definitely worse than expected, but it wasn't like atrociously bad. It was just slightly less than expectations. Um, but you know, this just goes to show you that the markets don't care. The markets are more about emotions. And today, I think I think this whole week is an emotional day. I think you had people chasing this market and just saying, "I got to buy it because we're going to go ripping back up." My guess is over the next week, you'll probably see that enthusiasm slow, and then we'll continue back towards that slow grind down that we've been on. But I uh, could be wrong. I don't have much of an interest in it now because my options are closed out. Mm. Uh, what else do I got? When you, buy for long, when you buy for long on Amazon and Google, market cap, 1.6 trillion, 1.8 trillion, is there more room to run when, when the split? Well, certainly with the Amazon split, the assumption historically historically is that it's going to run until that split date so is i watch amazon today but um you know there's a rip going on on amazon right now and looking pretty good my guess is this will probably continue until we get that split which what was the big ebb was june 4th i think it's june 4th do you think bitcoin would give a good short um for a quick day trade from the 20 40 30 um i mean look you look at the the Bitcoin price chart, to me, you're kind of just stuck on this little range bound piece right here. I personally wouldn't short it at 42. You know, if anything, you're going to do it when it gets back up to 45,000 because that's been the ceiling, a very defined ceiling for the better part of this year. So 
of course, anything can happen out there, KF. Uh, anything can absolutely anything can happen, and you're kind of at this point where it's sold off from before. So sure, you know, it may be worth a chance for a shorter term trade, but you know, I think the the bigger bucks. The bigger money is going to be on waiting for it to get to 45,000 and then see if it comes all the way back down to the low, which is going to be 35. And if we get bouncing back and forth in this range, like the Russell 2000 did almost all of last year, um, then that's when you get the much bigger trades. Uh, oh, yeah, Alan. Sorry, I don't know that. I don't know that imbalance number. Bitcoin and Ethereum equals buy, 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 buy. I agree. I just bought some more Ethereum, actually. Bought another another grand worth of Ethereum, and I will continue to build that position. Uh, after watching the interview with Joe Lubin that was done by Daniel Roberts, who we interviewed on Tuesday, um, I, you know, he's a very connected, very smart person, and he was like, who, those who hold Ethereum will be re- are going to be very rewarded. And I was like, okay, I had to buy some more. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Uh, cheers, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I hope you had a great trading week. Again, uh, put your comments down below the YouTube videos. Monday will be uh, an open forum show because, again, uh, I'll be not doing shows the remainder of the week, and I'll probably be back on Wednesday. So I'm going to be gone a little over a week. What are you going to do without me? Oh, no. I'm sure you'll be fine. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a stand-in to do the show for me, so we'll have to just take some time off. But uh, who knows? Maybe I'll do a, a little live broadcast from the, from the beach as I'm soaking up a cocktail at my all-inclusive resort, which I deserve, damn it. I need an all-inclusive resort. So if you have comments, questions, feedback, put them down below the YouTube video. If it's something more personal, you can always email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. I actually received a couple very nice emails that were, uh, we'll just say, very personal uh, but shed some light on a couple things I had no clue about going on behind some scenes. So thank you guys so much for that information. Uh, it's always nice that I can uh, help fix problems with people or situations. I love that. All right, that's going to do it for me, everybody. Cheers. Have a fantastic remainder of your weekend. Do- go do something good. Be a good person. I'll see you all on uh, Monday. Take care.